This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, my sisters and brothers. It is yet another opportunity that we can come out and give God some praise and some glory for all the blessings that he's bestowed upon us. For truly, God is worthy to be praised. We thank you for worshiping with us virtually this morning. If you are a visitor, we thank you for joining us this morning. And we know that you will indeed be blessed by this virtual worship experience this morning. We have a very talented praise and worship team. We're going to be singing to the glory of God. And you will hear a powerful and prolific word from our anointed pastor, the Dr. Reverend Aaron Dobon Sr. So you will indeed be blessed this morning. Amen. Amen. We do have a few announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, the first is we ask that you just continue to keep our family in prayer here at Shallow, those that are dealing with illness, sickness, and those that are in convalescent homes. We ask you to also to continue those to keep those in prayer that are dealing with death or loss within their families as well. Pick up the phone. Give them a call. Just let them know that you're thinking about them. Let them know that you care about them. It's amazing what just a phone call will do when someone is dealing with grief or they're lonely or just dealing with the loss. So I encourage us to do that with our sisters and brothers. Amen. We also invite you to remain logged on after the preach word this morning. Our pastor will be administering Holy Communion. So we ask that you get your elements ready to be administered after the preach word this morning so that you can partake of Holy Communion. These are our announcements, and we ask that you govern yourselves accordingly. Our scripture reading for this morning will come from the book of Colossians, and I will be reading from chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Once again, it will be coming from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And I will be reading from the New International Version. And it reads as thus. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if in any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. May God bless the hearers and doers of his word. Let us pray. Dear eternal, merciful Father, as once again we come before you, giving you thanks and praise, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for just another opportunity that we're able just to, to call out to you, Lord, and just say, Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings and all the things that you've done for us, Lord. You blessed us with so many things that we did not deserve, but through grace and mercy, you saw fit to bless us anyway, Lord. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for just another Sunday morning that you allowed us to wake up, allowed us to get up and clothe ourselves, allowed us to wake up in our right mind, thinking clearly, Lord. You didn't have to do it, Lord, but yet you did. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the preached word that's going to come about this morning, Lord. We thank you for the praises that are going to be sang up to you this morning, Lord. We thank you for the musicians who are going to be playing to glorify you this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all these talents that are being used to glorify you, Lord. We invoke your spirit on this virtual worship experience this morning, Lord. We ask that the word that will go forth will touch and prick someone's heart, Lord. 
Someone's dealing with a need and an issue that only you know about, Lord. We ask that something that'll be sung or something that'll be read or something that'll be preached this morning, Lord, will minister and touch that need that that person is dealing with, Lord. There are sick among us, Lord, within our church, within our family. There's a visitor on this virtual worship experience this morning that's in need of a healing, Lord. We ask that you touch their bodies, Lord. Those that are dealing with depression, Lord, we ask that you touch their minds, Lord. Give them comfort. Give them peace, Lord. There's somebody that was given a dreaded diagnosis. Lord, please comfort them and let them know that you are the great physician and you have the last say-so, not a doctor, Lord. Tell them just to keep hope alive in their spirits, Lord. We ask that you continue to touch those that are looking for employment opportunities, Lord. We ask a special blessing to come their way, Lord. There are caretakers that are taking care of sick family members, sick loved ones. We ask that you continue to be with them and strengthen and encourage them as well, Lord. We ask that you continue to bless our city, our state, and our country. We ask that you bless those leaders that have been given the task of leading those constituents that have voted them into office, Lord. We ask that you continue to bless them to make decisions that aren't self-serving, but that are rather in the interest of the people that they've been voted to actually serve, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Keep them, Lord. We ask that you continue to bless us as we go forth living the Christian life so that we can be light to others and bring others to Christ, Lord. We ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' matchless name. All those who love the Lord virtually say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen. Amen. amen.
but the blood saved me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why I'm trading my sorrows and my sickness. I'm laying it all down for the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah.
that has made us and not we ourselves. And since he made us, he knows everything about us. Lord have mercy. Does that ever make you cringe? It ought to. Because we learn to, to play church and to become good thespians, actors. And the Bible says that the Lord knows our thoughts afar off. If that doesn't make you tremble, I'm almost at a point of saying there's no hope for you. Because you can't sit there, I can't stand here and declare that all my thoughts are godly and pure. Amen. I wish I had a witness already. So then, the good news is that perfection is not required for ministry. Perfection is not required for service. God takes us as we are. And he looks beyond our thoughts and sees our needs. And he looks at us as works in progress. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I just said something. And if God looks at each of us as works in progress, then ought we not look at each other as works in progress also. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. I love that song. All the songs that this marvelous music ministry performs. Amen. You bless my heart. And I, I feel like worshiping him. I feel like serving him. They usher us to a place. Yeah, because music sets the mood. Amen. Whether it's wherever else you think of. And also as we come before the Lord to offer words of praise. And finally, I want to say thank you for the great and marvelous job that was done last week as we honored our graduates. We're so proud of our graduates, and even if your child or grandchild did not graduate, you ought to be thankful that children are yet accomplishing things and doing things to better all of humanity. Amen. And so we salute all of our 2021 graduates, those of college, high school, and other areas of matriculation. I want to thank the committee, uh, Deacon Sidney Robinson, uh, his lovely bride, Sister S.J. Robinson, uh, Sister Gwen Davis, Reverend Ritter Armstead, our great and wonderful committee for all that they did in making sure that our graduates were recognized. Amen. And last but not least, I want to thank the Reverend Curtis Edmonds, Jr., amen, uh, for preaching all of the gospel on last week. I was shouting where I was, listening to the word of God preached. I felt, I felt the Holy Ghost because he encouraged us by saying that if you want to walk on water, you first got to get out of the boat. Bless the name of the Lord in this place. Keep on preaching, preaching. Amen. God's got great things for you. While I'm on Brother Curtis, he's too humble to say it. We know that he recently finished the greatest seminary known to man, the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. Hey, old man. Amen. But uh, uh, like Jesus in the text, it says Jesus went a little further. He plans to go a little further, and he's already been accepted into the prestigious New Brunswick Theological Seminary in the state of New Jersey, amen. Pastored by president, the president and leader of that group uh, is one of our, also one of my dear friends who led us on our mission trips to Haiti, uh, the Reverend Dr. Micah McCrary, amen. He's the president of a seminary where most of the people who have ever been in leadership didn't look like him, amen. What a marvelous God we serve, amen. I want you to remember those who are sick and shut in you know the list. You know who they are. And we want to pray for one another that God would give us strength. Amen. Uh, today is the 4th of July. Amen. And you should celebrate. Because in the year of 1775, the first person who died for the liberty of what became the United States is a black man by the name of Crispus Attucks. Amen. He was fighting for freedom, and we're still fighting for freedom today. Amen. And then you celebrate the 4th of July, but you also celebrate Juneteenth. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord in this place. Well, I'm excited about this preaching moment that is before us. Let me get to my assignment. Turn with me, if you will, 
the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6. And I want to commend to your hearing the verses 1 through 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. You find it and it reads like this. Jesus left there. Stick a pin right there. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's his wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. I want to share with us for the next little while from this subject, when I get home, when we get home. When I get home, when we get home. The year was 1978, and the venerable Dinah Ross, starring as Dorothy in The Wiz, an Afrocentric, soulful, cooler, rather than contemporary version of the 1935 classic, The Wizard of Oz. Dinah Ross, like her counterpart, Judy Garland, both find themselves in a different world from the one that they came from when the Harlem school teacher tries to save her dog from a storm, she's miraculously whisked away to an urban fantasy land called, you guessed it, Oz. Dorothy wants to get out of Oz. She wants to leave Oz and return to her home in Brooklyn. Dorothy separately, desperately desires to go back to the place that is familiar, a place, a place that nurtured her, a place that allowed her to blossom, a place that helped her to grow and become the person that she became. And after a series of unfortunate events, she desires to go back home. And you've been there, haven't you? Away from home, away from that which is familiar. You want to go back home, away on vacation, although you're enjoying it very much. Something about a couple of days of being away, you want to sleep in your own bed. Even when you're in the military and you're defending a country, that you sometimes are not defended by. Uh, you want to go back home. When you're at college even, you, you long to hear uh, familiar sounds and see familiar faces and, and eat some familiar foods. And you want to go back home. And, and maybe uh, even if you were at the big house one time, you really, you really want to go back home. Uh, but I must tell you that in this, this story of ours, uh, Glenda, who's played by the wonderful, beautiful, lovely Lena Horne, the good fairy, said, look, this is what you got to do, Dorothy. Dorothy, you got to close your eyes. You got to close your eyes so you can visualize home. You got to close your eyes. You got to close your mind and think only of home. And then simultaneously, you got to click your heels together. Click those heels together three times, repeating these magical, marvelous words, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And then she sings, when I think of home, I think of a place where there's love overflowing. Yet, if the truth be told, home is not always what it looks like from the outside looking in. Home can be a home, but it can also be a living nightmare for some. Home, for some people, can be hell on earth. Some people linger as long as they can, not wanting to pull up in the driveway, put their key in the door, and walk in because it's not home. It's somewhere else. Not everything at home and in home is good. 
Miss Seeley in The Color Purple and Jenny in Forrest Gump movie can tell you that unfortunately that sometimes home is not always a blissful place. It's not always a nurturing place. It's not always a place where there are loving people on the other side of the door. For some people, home is not all of that is cracked up to be. Here in our text, Mark, the writer of this text, records that Jesus, like both Dorothy, like Miss Seeley, like Jenny, may have found that home can sometimes be a lot less attractive than we want to admit. Sometimes it's not what it appears uh, from the outside looking in. In verse 1 of chapter 6, here in our text, look at these words. Look at these words. Mark says, Jesus left there. Jesus left there. The red flag ought to go up. You ought to want to know a little bit more about where there is and what it means to be there. Jesus left there and went to his hometown. Briefly, let's look at the things that happened in this there place. Before Jesus went home, in this place, Jesus is followed by throngs of people. It is so compact, so tight, if you will. It's like some of those clubs. You, I mean, I know y'all didn't go to clubs, but some of those clubs I heard people used to go to where you couldn't Vaseline another person around the wall. It was so thick. One door in and one door out. Lord, have mercy. And look, we're still here. Somebody ought to say, praise the Lord. All jammed up together. Jesus utters a question in this form. He asked the question where the people are packed in like sardines. Jesus had the audacity and gall to ask, who touched me? I, I wonder what some of the responses would have been if he'd been with some of the boys in the hood. The crowd is thick, and Jesus seems to be acting a bit strangely about what appears to be a perchance touch and ask, who touched me? The disciples wonder, is he all right? Is he all right? Is he cool? Uh, with this crowd being all about us, and, and, and they are all trying to get close to you, and, and people have been touching you. The question is not who touched you. The question should be who didn't touch you. Frightened woman. The Bible says who had suffered from a 12-year gynecological disorder came timidly forward, admitting that she had accidentally bumped into Jesus. No, she didn't accidentally bump into him. She intentionally went after Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes we bump into Jesus. Lord have mercy. Come on, help me now. You get in trouble, you just bump into Jesus. But it's a good thing when you desperately seek after Jesus. Lord have mercy. Can I give somebody an analogy that might help you out? You're trying to get to the mall before it closed. You're trying to get there. You run a few red lights because you want to get there. Uh, Lord, before we got the blue laws lifted, you it was on Saturday night before that at Alphabet store closed. A B, C, you were trying to get there. You were desperately putting everything you had like Usain Bolt trying to get there. This woman was in that same vein trying to get to Jesus. She was, she was hurt. She was disappointed. She had little energy, but she used all that she could muster up just to touch the hem of his garment. She even imagined, if I but touch, Lord have mercy. I've been everywhere. I've spent everything I've had. I'm broke, boasted, busted, and disgusted. I don't have any money in the bank. But if I could just touch Jesus, I just know the woman says everything would be all right. Her touch was a desperate desire to reach out to this doctor, this healer who could correct all kinds of maladies. Uh, and brothers and sisters, indeed, this anonymous stranger that we only know as the woman with the issue of blood, this story suggests that when she touched Jesus and she was instantaneously healed, that story spread far and wide. The song says, he touched me. Yes, he touched me. But in this instance, this woman touched Jesus and folk are still talking about it to this day. At the same time, Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, finds himself in a desperate situation, a desperate situation that a parent finds himself or herself in, when your child is in trouble and you can't do anything about it, there's no situation more desperate than that. When your child, your flesh and blood is in trouble and you can't do a doggone thing about it, that puts you between a rock and a hard place, between the devil and the deep blue sea. His 12-year-old daughter, just 12 years of age, is sick. And actually, she's not sick. She's already dead. Read the text. Jesus tells Jairus, let's go to your house. 
And when they arrive at the domicile, people are all around. They're mourning. They're crying, crying their eyes out. There are screams and screeches that are so loud that it could have shattered glass. The crowd stops mourning when Jesus utters these words that appear to be rather insensitive. It seems like Jesus is playing with people's emotions. Jesus said, the girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. And mourning turns to laughter. Ha, 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 ha. You must be crazy. We looked at her. We took her pulse. We watched her chest, and there was no rising and lowering. Sleep, man, you must be out of your ever-loving mind. She is dead. She's dead as a doorknob. She's as dead as dead can be. Jesus had something else in mind. And he offers us a valuable teaching lesson right here at this point of the text, which is you can't do your best work when you have a whole lot of negative naysayer energy in your environment. Sometime the Lord has put a vision in your life before you and, and you share it with a few people and these are dream killers. And they are like spiritual vampires. They will zap your energy and make you want to pull your head into a shell like a turtle. You and I must, uh, then when this situation uh, brings us to this point, we got to pull a Johnny Taylor. I know you young people are too young to remember Johnny Taylor, but Johnny Taylor said you got to steal away. You got to steal away. When you find yourself surrounded by negative folk and God has cast a vision in your spirit, you've got to separate yourself from that negativity so that God can use you to take you to where God is trying to take you. Separate yourself from this negativity that, that sometimes will keep you from fulfilling your destiny. Separate yourself from that which will prevent you from manifesting your purpose. Jesus puts everybody out, puts everybody out the house, which suggests that some folk go in right now, but you need to put them out. I don't know who they are, but there are some folk in your life that you will never, ever reach your destiny until you put them out. There's nobody in the room. Put everybody out. I like to see Jesus doing that. I imagine I'm, ha I'm having a flashback of Jesus clearing the temple. Because, you know, some folks are like, he's talking about me. He ain't like, I'm not leaving until uh, Jesus made him leave. You remember Jesus sat in that temple braiding a cord, singing that song? You know, that DMX song. I think I heard you mention that. Y'all going to make me lose my mind. He's just braiding it. Up in here, up in here, y'all going to make me act a fool up in here, up in here. And when Jesus raised up, uh, even the toughest guy in there, about 6'5", 300 pounds of pure muscle, he started running out like a scaredy cat. He put everybody out except Jairus, his wife, and his three homies, Peter, James, and John. Jesus took the little girl by the hand and said to her, little girl, I say to you, Get up. <laughs> You're not seeing this. You're not feeling me right now. Uh, I'm reading it from the NIV. He said to her, little girl. He didn't just say, get up. That's what mama says when you're almost late for school. Uh, that's what daddy says when you got to go do your homework. But this was Jesus saying, little girl, I say to you, get up. Lord, have mercy. The Lord is speaking these words to somebody today. I say to you, get up. Get up, get up, get on up, get up, get on up. Get up from your place of sadness. Get up from your weeping. Get up from the death. Get up from the loss and despair. Get up from that place of public humiliation. In Jesus' life can come for even when you've been crucified. Hear his words. Get up, I say. Get up. Everyone was amazed. The Bible said they were astonished. They couldn't believe their own eyes. Jesus said, uh, don't tell anyone and give her something to eat. Let me just back up for a minute. I love the Lord. Cry. Pity my every groan. As long as I live while troubles rise, I'll hasten to his throne. I'll do whatever he tells me to do. But I understand these folks in this text. When somebody does something for you that good, you can't hold your peace. Lord, how many? You have told folks stuff you shouldn't have told them that wasn't even half as good as this. But Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Jesus, you might as well understand 
I'm just an old broken refrigerator. I can't keep nothing. And I'm going to tell everybody I know. And apparently Mark suffered from the same thing because he wrote it down and told me and told you that the Lord said to this little girl who was dead and the undertaker was on his way to pick her up. But Jesus said, not today. Lord, have mercy. Do you not know that the undertaker had your address and was ready to pick you up? But the Lord spoke and intervened, even though you didn't know anything about it, and said, not today, you out there on 95, out on Route 1, out there, out there, out there, and you could have been dead, sleeping in your grave. But the Lord said, bless his holy name, not today. Not today, say, not today. Lord, have mercy. Soon, some stopped talking about his miraculous deeds. And started talking about his educational accomplishments, or in their minds, lack thereof. Jesus sounds like a scholar. Did he go to Virginia Union? Jesus sounds like he's been somewhere. Did he go to Harvard? Did he go to Yale? Did he go to New Brunswick? They started talking about his pedigree. You know, folks start whispering. Somebody said his mom was pregnant before they got married. His mom, you know, his mom and them, and we know them. We know them, don't we? He's a carpenter. He's a jackleg preacher. Where did he go to school? He's not in our fraternity. He's not a member of our chamber of commerce. He's not what he appears to be. Who's his daddy? Who his daddy in them is? Away from home, Jesus is well received. Away from home, Jesus is afforded great appreciation. Away from home, he is a promise keeper, a miracle worker, light in the darkness, and more. But at home, where, where they... They call him Jesus uh, sometimes. They have other names for him, you know. You got, you got a name on your birth certificate, but folks got another name for you. You might not even know it. They got a name for you. You know that old so-and-so. I'm, I'm Reverend Dr. Aaron Dovines, right? But I know I got some other names. Bless your heart. It's all right. Uh, see, they call Jesus. They don't call him Jesus, Master, Lord. At home, they call him Junebug. They call him Baby now. They call them names I cannot utter in this place, but use your imagination. When Jesus says in verse 4, with a deal of sadness that comes from the text, read it. A prophet is without honor in his own town, among his own relatives, and in his own home. Sad words indeed. Rejection, my brothers and sisters, in life, on this journey called life, is inevitable. You will be rejected. But nothing hurts like being rejected by people that you've helped. Nothing hurts like being rejected by the people that you helped up when they were down. Nothing hurts like when people that you try to, to lift up are the same folks who come after you and try to tear you down. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, could it be that we treat Jesus like he's being treated in this text? I'm not talking about the folk in this text 2,000 years ago, but could it be that we become too familiar with Jesus? Oh, my brother and my sister, could it be that we treat Jesus like he's being treated in this text today? Jesus, very God and very man all at the same time. He will come down to where you are, won't he do it? Jesus will, oh yes, he will come down to our level. But he does so to also allow us the opportunity to be raised up to the next level. He doesn't come down to where we are. An eagle doesn't come down to where buzzards are to stay with the buzzards. An eagle comes down to raise the buzzards up to think like eagles, to fly like eagles, to walk like eagles, to talk like eagles, so that you can fulfill your destiny. Your destiny is not down there. Your destiny is up here. He's trying to raise you up. He's trying to raise up a standard. Yes, he's a friend. Yes, he walks with me. Yes, he talks with me. But don't you ever forget who he is. <laughs> Just because he hangs out with you. If I had the privilege of hanging out with 44, 44, 44, Barack Hussein Obama. And we start shooting a little basketball. And we start talking a little stuff, as men might do. I cannot forget I'm still talking to the president of the United States of America. Because the president is always recognized as a president, even if they get impeached. Okay, I'll leave that alone. 
And just because you're able to hang out with the stars, if you will, don't forget who they are. Don't forget who Jesus is because you perhaps are on a first name basis. He's still the Emmanuel. He's still, I tell you, the bright and morning star. He's still Lord and Savior. Don't get it twisted. Don't you ever allow contempt to come up because you know him and you think you know him well and he's allowed you to be close up. Instead, since you know him, you ought to know who he is and you know what he did for you and you know where he brought you from. You know what he did as he opened the door and made it possible for you to be where you are today, uh, this way maker, because he made a way for you. Don't forget who he is just because you know him by his first name. We call him Jesus. But down in the deep red clay hills of Alabama, when we grew up, you would be, wouldn't be called dead called an adult by their first name. It's so much so that I have many members of this church and every church I've pastored who are far older than I am. But I dare not call them by their first name. I know who I am. I'm comfortable in my own skin, but I'm going to put a handle on your name because that's how O.C. and Leola and the elders of my village taught me. If you want to make me mad, madder than a wet hen, let me see a youngster call somebody of senior years by their first name. You have not earned the right to call them. You're not their equal. You are their junior, and they're your senior. Jesus came down. Jesus came down, but, but we were taught you need to put a handle on his name. Robert Blair, and with his brothers and friends who make up the violin airs, they sang a song a few years ago that didn't just say Jesus. They call him Dr. Jesus. Y'all remember that song? And they said, I can't do that voice like uh, they, they would do, but they say something like, Dr. Jesus, he will make everything all right. In a very tenor voice, very high pitched voice. That was all right, wasn't it? Put your hands together for your pastor. I like that song. I like it also because they put a handle yeah. <laughs> on his name. Yeah. Well, he's healed you, and you ought to call him Dr. Jesus. Uh, uh, they learned growing up in Mississippi that, that you don't call people of this stature by their first name. Let me go back to the 44th president of these United States. I, I, I wouldn't dare hang out with him and say, hey, Barack, what's up, baby? No. No, unless he just twisted my arm and made me say it, I probably still couldn't say it. I would have to say, Mr. President. I'd be proud to say that a man that looks like me, as I see my own reflection, it was the president of the United States of America. I, I know you AKA sisters are proud to see our vice president, but she is not Kamala Harris. You say that at your house, but when you meet a vice president, president in waiting, I say, Kamala Harris. Amen. Amen. Call him President Jesus. Why? Because the government is on his shoulders. Call him Dr. Jesus, the psychiatrist, because there was a man cutting himself in the tomb. And, and Jesus, yeah, not using the DMS3, but using all of his spiritual ability, brought the demons out of the man. He is a psychiatrist. Right. Call him company keeper. Because when you're lonely, when you don't have a friend in the world, won't he come see about you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Call him. Yeah, call him a friend to the friendless. When everybody else walks out on you and don't have a good word to say about you, the good news is that he is a friend. Somebody picked up pen and paper and said, what a friend. We have in Jesus. Is he your friend today? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry every, 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 everything to God in prayer. This problem that I had, I pulled my hair out. I placed the floor. I walked from one end to the other, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I just couldn't sing the song. I tried and I tried. But I just got deeper involved. But I had an aha moment. In the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of what you're going through, you ought to have a spiritual aha moment and call on Dr. Jesus. Call on 
baker Jesus. Call on miracle working Jesus, and he will. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He will, he will, he will, he will work it out. What won't he do it? You may not know it, but I'm not from here. Sometime I run into people here in Fredericksburg and they remind me, you're not from here. When I was in Shreveport, pastoring for 13 years, there were people who reminded me, even after 10 plus years, you're not from here. You were born in Alabama. But I want you to know this world is not my home. I'm not from Alabama. I'm not from Virginia. I'm not from Louisiana. I'm from somewhere else. And one of these glad mornings, some glad morning when this life is over, I'm going home. Do I have a witness? I'm going home because I got a home waiting for me over in glory. Yes, no more doctors, no more sickness, no more heartaches, no more this, no more that. Cares are past. Home at last. Ever to rejoice in a place where I'll never never grow old on the other side of no more no more pain no more sickness no more heartaches no more cemeteries over yonder where the wicked cease from troubling and our weary souls shall find rest can't nobody i said can't nobody do me like jesus can't nobody do me like the lord yeah he walks with me, he talks with me, and he lets me know everything, everything, every, 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 everything is going to be all right. Can I get a witness here? The Lord will honor his word. You might be rebuked and scorned. You might be talked about down here, but after a while, after a while, yes, yes. Yes, and by and by, God will, won't he do it? I said, God will, yes, he will, yeah, yeah, oh, yes. He will, he will, he will, he will work it out for you. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare throw in the towel. Don't you dare give up on the Lord. Grandma told you, were you listening? Big Daddy told you, were you listening? He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Yes, he is. The doors of the church stand open. You need a friend down here. Not a fair weather friend. You need a real friend. And a real friend is not just gonna tell you what you wanna hear. A real friend, bless the Lord, will give you a mint when you need one. <laughs> uh, they're not gonna talk about you behind your back. They, they'll pull it out the purse, it might have some pure perfume smell to it, but uh, they'll help you out in your time of trouble, won't they, Billy? And as good as your ace is, they can't compare to Jesus. You and I will still be trying to figure it out years and years and years in eternity about how much he loves us so. You don't have an idea. We're scratching the surface. It's a, it's a terrible approximation. But I can tell you this. He loved you and me enough to die for us. Lord, have mercy. It doesn't get any better than that. A man who laid out his life for a friend. He counts you and me as friends. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care where you are right now. He's available. The question is, are you? He's waiting. I'm tenderly calling. He's waiting. He's waiting on you. How do you know? Because I met him for myself. How do you know? Because on a dark Friday, a thief who had stolen all of his life and was even mocking Jesus initially at Calvary. 
Yes, the one on the right initially started out like the one on the left. Saying, if you you all of that, bruh, save yourself and save us while you're at it. But he got convicted in the ninth hour, late in the midnight hour. He got convicted and said to him, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom, take me with you. And the record is he did. He ushered them from that horrible place to a place of peace. He's available to do that for you right now. There's a number on the screen. People want to pray with you. They want to help you get to know him for yourself. And if you already know him, get to know him better. Because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I don't care how long you've been in the church. You ought to still have some newness in your relationship with the Lord. You ought not get boring. Because there's more and more he wants to teach you and take you and offer you and give you. There's more than just being saved. That's a good thing. But there's more. He wants to make you his friend, his partner. Yes, he wants to be with you and me in that intimate way. Today is Holy Communion. We remember how much he loved us and loves us every time we share in this precious moment, this holy moment. You can give without loving. Now, some people have ulterior motives for when they give you something. They want something in return. It's quid pro quo. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. But Jesus reminds us that you cannot love without giving. And what you give is not always money. A lot of times we think about giving, the first thing we think about is currency. But there's a currency that's greater than money. It's called love. The bread, he said to his disciples in the upper room and to us today, represents my body. That's how much I love you, Shiloh. Take and eat, for this represents my body. You hear a lot today about people using this analogy to say you got to put some skin in the game. If you really want to be seen as valid and real and sincere, you can't be a wimp. You got to be willing to put some skin in the game. Jesus said, I got skin and blood and bones to put in this. The cup represents his great sacrifice, his precious shed blood. Drink ye all of it. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Blessed Holy Ghost. When they finished, they went out from the upper room. They went into prayer in Gethsemane's garden. I want to suggest to us that we make prayer a priority in our lives. Don't just dream about it. Don't just wish about it. Pray to God about it. And if the Lord says no, don't be fretful. Because the Lord's blessings can come in good, better, and best. And you're settling for good. He's got something better for you. Sometimes you live long enough to say, thank you, Lord, for not giving me what I, for what I thought I wanted. Can I get somebody to say amen to that? You thought you wanted him, I mean them, whatever. You thought you wanted it, but the Lord said, no. Nah. The Lord said, I got something better for you. And now you're shouting all over the place, saying, thank you, Lord, for not giving me what I thought I wanted, the job I thought I wanted, this that I thought I wanted, that that I thought I wanted, but he gave you better. Bless his name. So we've done as the Lord has asked. And again, we thank you being part of this worship experience. Let's go to God in prayer and let's receive the benediction. Eternal God, how we bless you again. We thank you. We can't thank you enough for your many and sundry blessings. Lord, bless that person who's teetering and tottering on the brink of decision. Help them to make the decision to say, I will follow Jesus. Help them to say, I will follow his example. Help them to say, I've been in church. I know I'm saved, but I want to have a closer walk with him. Help us, Lord, to be brother and sister to each other. Help us to be what you want us to be as family here so that we can be family there. Bless us now as we go down from this place. And 
now, and may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us now and forevermore. Together we say, Amen.